dark and it's late. Yes, it's time for this week's edition of Hollywood Report, the insider's guide to what's happening in the epicenter of the film world. This week we take a look at the new movie starring Steven Seagal, where he plays a tough guy who's turned a little green. We can only pollute so much more before everybody just starts dying. Dubbed the Madame of Hollywood, Heidi Flies hits the streets again, but this time it's to help the homeless. Since I'm thrust into this position that never expected, never wanted, and if in some way it could help, let it help. We investigate what makes for that special chemistry on the big screen. The truth is that what makes movies romantic is often not sex at all. And just how fit is Hollywood? Who keeps fit and who stays fat? I think that affects a person's career. You can't very well be a, uh, in a leading role and be, you know, very much overweight, I wouldn't think. Heidi Fleiss caused a bit of a stir late last year when it was revealed that she was supplying prostitutes to Hollywood's top executives. She soared to instant notoriety as the papers pursued her for the hard facts, while Hollywood's hotshots went running for cover. Now she's up for trial in a few weeks' time and she's pulling out all the stops to appear like the good, God-fearing American girl she obviously is. Heidi's in front of the camera again. It's not as crazy as her court appearance last August on charges of supplying prostitutes and drug possession, but this event, an autograph session to help the homeless, drew a slew of reporters. Um, just keep them back, we're behind us. I hate cameras. So why does Heidi Fleiss put herself out there? Since I'm thrust into this position that never expected, never wanted, and if in some way it could help, let it help. The woman who describes herself as a charity case is donating proceeds from her line of pajamas, robes, and casual wear to help the less fortunate. Fleiss, who police say was the largest supplier of prostitutes to Hollywood's elite, is very much in demand these days. She even has a publicist. I don't want any cameras even in there where I'm signing. This image of helping the homeless is so different from the Heidi image that Americans have got from the televising of the arraignment hearing last August. So, outside of the courtroom, who is Heidi Fly? This one I don't even know. I really don't. I've just learned a lot about uh, people and, and how ugly our society is. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Since the hearing, does Fleiss feel she has any friends left in the world? Of course I have friends. I think so. Who is it? Pablo Picasso. Friends, I have none. I don't know. Heidi's next public appearance is in front of a judge in a courtroom later this month. I wonder if you'll get a free pair of Heidi pajamas as well. Seagal plays an oil industry roughneck who puts out fires for an aggressive independent oil company run by Michael Caine. The movie carries a strong environmental theme. We can only pollute so much more before everybody just starts dying. You know, people are dying of cancer now like, you know, ten times more than they were ten years ago. And you don't hear about that. I, uh, I gotta say I'm a little ashamed of you. I'd just like to ask you something. How much is enough? Seagal's character learns the oil company is unconcerned about damaging the Alaskan wilderness, so he teams up with Eskimos to defend their native lands against drilling. The movie was shot on location in Alaska and northern Washington state. How strong an environmental message can the audience expect from On Deadly Ground? Well, I hope strong enough to, to get them to really think about what we can do to, you know, change the powers that be from manipulate us into just being on the road to doom you know because we really need to change our representatives and, and the legislation so that those who pollute are you know put away at last a gun wielding explosives expert who really cares about the planet mm. steven seagal comes to britain to save the globe on march the 11th <laughs> As almost 61% of all music is sold on CDs and only 4% sold as records, you'd think that vinyl has well and truly had its day. But no, in America, a backlash has swept the nation against the clinical quality of that shiny little disc, and demand has soared for the magical sound of a scratchy record. But for why? Vinyl records were once considered to be dead and buried, but now they are experiencing a resurge in popularity. 
Pearl Jam and Nirvana and a number of alternative bands released vinyl versions of their latest albums. Now Capitol Records has released the Beatles' first U.S. single from 1964, I Wanna Hold Your Hand. Oh, yeah, tell you something. We wanted to commemorate the, uh, the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of the Beatles coming to America. And this was the first single, I Wanna Hold Your Hand, which made it all happen for the Beatles. Back in 1964, this sold 12 million copies. I mean, that's how big the seven inch vinyl, the single mark, the singles market was back then. Research confirmed that a vinyl Beatles re-release would sell nearly as fast as it did the first time. We've always known that there's a strong collector market for seven inch singles, particularly oldies sell extremely well on seven inch. And I think it's predominantly the collector, someone who, I mean, this, for example, probably won't even get played by 80% of the people that buy it. They'll just take it home, put it in the cupboard with their collection of Beatles albums, CDs, cassettes, that sort of thing. Although new vinyl releases are making a comeback in many record stores, some retail outlets have always thrived on selling vinyl. We've always sold records. Our records have been important to us since the day we opened, and uh, I get many complaints from people that they can't buy something on vinyl and only on CD. At Aaron's, the Pearl Jam and Nirvana vinyl releases sold nearly as many units as the compact disc. Rape me. Rape me, my friend. From professional collectors to everyday fans, vinyl is hip again for a variety of reasons. If you're an artist and you're designing uh, an artwork for a 12 by 12 uh, scheme and then, uh, you know, the record company shrinks it down to a little 4 by 4 um, you know, boy, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty hurtful. I do know a graphic artist that does that. And, he says, boy, squeezing everything into a little format is, is pretty tough. It's just neater. It's just so much more fun to play, and it's just it got the big pictures and the extra tracks, mostly. Cost is one reason. I mean, you take a look in our used bins, and you've got a tremendous selection, priced at 29 cents. I mean, you can't beat that. Also, 99-cent vinyl. I mean, you can walk out of here with a stack of 15 records that you can for the price of one CD. Even those whose livelihoods are supported primarily from CD sales prefer vinyl to compact disc. I miss the 12-inch sleeve, frankly. I really love the, you know, that amount of space that you can you know, put together a sleeve, a design, the graphics, the photographs. I particularly miss that aspect of it. I always feel a better, a, a more, more of a warmth from uh, vinyl. It, it does seem to change over time. Obviously, some of that is because the needle is wearing the record a little bit. Uh, it isn't exactly the same each time. Um, I always get a very mechanical feel when I listen to a, a CD. No matter how fondly some yearn for the old days of vinyl, compact discs are here to stay. The only thing the current resurgence proves is that many Americans aren't quite ready to let vinyl go the way of the eight-track tape. If you want your career to go places in Hollywood, you have got to be fit. There are no male sex symbols with overdeveloped beer guts, and leading ladies are nearly always thin and glamorous. But this doesn't come easy. Actors have to train hard to get those bulging biceps and work out to get that desirable figure. Easier for some than others. Come on, Ed! Marrow's Place co-star Courtney Thorne-Smith combines recreation with her workout. Her conventional exercise routine is supplemented by daily walks with her dog. He's been great because he gets me moving. Like normally in the, I'd work out in the morning and in the afternoons nothing, but he gets me moving in the afternoons and I have to take him somewhere, I have to run him or I have to walk him and it's gotten me to know my neighbors. Great. Dogs are the greatest. Beverly Hills 90210 co-star David Gale adds spice to his routine by mountain biking whenever he can fit it into his schedule. Oh, it works out your legs quite a bit, but also uh, it, it, it forces your entire body. It, it's cardiovascular, so your entire body uh, gets into shape and and streamlines. Gail and Smith have created exercise routines that fit with their schedules and lifestyles. Even if I have a 6 a.m. call, I'm up at um, 4.30 to work out, because otherwise I feel uncomfortable all day. These actors stay in shape for themselves and their careers. Fashion photographer Ron Harris knows the fitness business. He produced Aerobicize 2000, a new home video workout series. He understands that actor shapes and size can determine which roles they play. The comedian, the fat person, is the bad person. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's been that way in Hollywood for years. 
Um, I think that affects a person's career. You can't very well be a, uh, in a leading role and be, you know, very much overweight, I wouldn't think. Comedian Pauly Shore is getting in shape for his next film. Yeah, uh, yeah. When you're getting paid a lot of money, you know, you have a job to do, you gotta focus, and people are paying you to do a job, so you, you wanna look good for them, so they can make money, and they can pay their, their pool bills in their Malibu homes. <laughs> Celebrities also talk about the importance of mental fitness. Actress Ally McGraw finds it through yoga. Come back without touching your right hand to the floor. Come back. I come, um, no matter what, and if it isn't the class I usually take, I take another one in that hour and a half that I can find. Well, that's all for part one. In part two, we try to discover the secret ingredients of on-screen chemistry, and we find out just how easy it is to go from Olympic star to Hollywood star. See you then. Hello and welcome back to part two of Hollywood Report. There are romances and partnerships in Hollywood's past that have lit up the screen and ignited the imagination of the audience. The best remembered and most revered are Bogart and Bacall and Tracy and Hepburn. But on-screen chemistry is not just a product of a bygone Hollywood era. Today producers are finding that on-screen chemistry works very well, but finding the right ingredients is as difficult as it ever was. Chemistry, whether or not a movie is successful at the box office, often depends on that elusive element between two people. When it works, it can be magic. When it doesn't, it can mean disaster. The idea is simple, the definition a little more difficult. People talk about the chemistry, and I guess I, I have an idea of what that is because it's sort of in a box, you know, it's a, and you come to work and it's in this sort of box of when the camera rolls and then when it's when it's off. It's extremely important that the lead's char characters hit it off. It's Leave me alone. It's At least it's I let it <laughs> Filmmakers know chemistry between two characters can enhance any movie. Casting director Dory Zuckerman worked on the highly successful film Pretty Woman, starring Richard Gere and Julia Roberts, directed by Gary Marshall. Julia just, you know, just bounces off the screen. She's so incredible. And, uh, and then seeing hi her and Richard work together, I think they had a nice rehearsal period, and, and Gary Marshall's just the best to work with. He's so, he's just the neatest guy. Um, I think it was a combination of the three of them all working together that really made that one work. When we think of on-screen chemistry, we can't help but reflect on those partners from the past. Bogart and Bacall, Tracy and Hepburn, Astaire and Rogers. It was black and white. It was more romantic. It was just, it was just, you know, it was a more romantic period of filmmaking. The truth is that what makes movies romantic is often not sex at all. Um, the great romantic movies, the romantic comedies, and just the straight romances, when people had sex with each other, it was by talking to one another. They flirted with words. Despite what many say, chemistry isn't exclusive of yesteryear. Director Nora Ephron brought back romance in Sleepless in Seattle by casting Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. Susan Sarandon and Kevin Costner had it in Bull Durham. Robert Redford and Barbara Streisand sparkled in The Way We Were. And this year's The Piano and the Age of Innocence featured actors who have a subtle yet distinct chemistry. Are you very much in love with her? The movie is so open to interpretation and, and so much of what people get out of the movie depends on what they bring into it. In the piano, Holly Hunter and Harvey Keitel's chemistry is heightened by one very important prop. Well, I think the piano is very sensual. I, I always have thought of the piano as being a very sensual instrument. Enchanting. As you know, she played the music. Actors don't have to have mutual admiration to make the movie work, but it helps. Rita Marino co-starred in 1962's West Side Story with George Takiris. Sometimes I don't know which is thicker, your skull or your accent. The chemistry that occurred in the movie really was between George Takiris and myself. We had a marvelous chemistry going, and uh, we're, we're still friends to this day. <laughs> Patrick Swayze found chemistry in Dirty Dancing with Jennifer Grey 
and again in Ghost with co-star Whoopi Goldberg. I'm real glad that the chemistry between she and I come off because I love that woman. She is the coolest black woman on the planet. She just, she's wonderful to work with. You know, we had a great time and, and, and the chemistry off the set translated to film, I think, and, and, and she's real neat. It comes from respect first. Before anyone can have any kind of chemistry, they have to have respect for each other. Poor Patty's been looking for his chemistry set ever since. The story that captivated America during the 17th Winter Olympic Games wasn't the Torval and Dean saga which held Britain in dismay last week, but the Kerrigan-Harding story which just got better and better as the contest went on, culminating in the Harding broken lace fiasco. The ice skating coverage achieved fantastic ratings in the States as they looked on to see if the good Kerrigan would triumph over the evil Tonya. Unfortunately, Russia ruined the tale by winning the gold, but Hollywood producers haven't let that ruin a perfectly good story. Yes, before the ice has even melted, the skating saga is going to be dramatized for a TV movie, and the search is on already for a Vincent Tonya Harding look-alike. Wait a minute, isn't that... No, it's not Tonya Harding. It's Tonya wannabe Christiana Barron. Barron is going after what she believes is the role she was born to play. She's appeared in several films and TV shows, and she's been a competitive figure skater for six years. Plus, she and Harding have a lot in common. We do have very similar looks, similar lives, which is really, you know, ironic, and um, right down to driving trucks and using the same asthma inhalers for skating. Barron has studied Harding's moves carefully. She hasn't mastered her signature triple jump, but she's working on it. Observers at this practice rink were impressed. Prettier. Definitely prettier, but yeah, she could do that. She needs to uh, be a little bit heftier. Tanya's really hefty. <laughs> Without my glasses, I, I had to double take it looking at her. Baron is determined. This is like my Olympics. This is my uh, chance at the gold and in Hollywood. <laughs> so while she's over at Lillehammer, I'm going to go for it here. Christiana says she's an actress first, but she is serious about her skating. She placed seventh in a regional competition, and she hopes to compete in the nationals. That is, unless Hollywood calls first. While Christiana holds her breath to see if she's cast as the Olympian, Tonya may also take heart in the fact that although she didn't win a medal, more sportsmen and women who achieve great sporting success can wind up with a movie contract of their own. The Olympics have supplied the movie business with fit household names for 40 years, and it first started with the screen star Sonia Henney. With the Winter Olympic Games in Lillehammer, Norway just finished, gold medalists could be stars in the making. Among those in Olympic history who have transformed their athletic talents into acting is Norway's own Sonja Henny. Step aside, Tonya, she's the original ice queen. Henny, a three-time gold medalist for figure skating, made her American film debut in the 1937 movie One in a Million. She went on to make 11 more films, becoming one of the biggest box office draws of the 30s and 40s. Cashing in on the Winter Games, Fox is releasing the Sonia Henney collection. If you don't want to marry me, I, I won't hold you to it. Buster Crabb won gold for swimming in the 400-meter freestyle in the 1932 Games. Best known for his roles as Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers, he appeared in more than 200 films. This yell made Johnny Weissmuller more famous than the five gold medals he won for swimming in the 1924 and 28 Olympics. Weissmuller starred in 12 Tarzan films. Tarzan, Jane, Tarzan, Jane. In 1938, Tarzan's Revenge brought two Olympic champions to the silver screen. Glenn Morris received the gold medal for the decathlon in 1936, and Eleanor Holm won top honors for the 100 meters backstroke in 1932. Holm never acted again.